Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for this eighth episode of our Intersector series, Conversations on Decarceration in the Arts. We've been hosting these conversations together to bring together artists, uh, activists, and policymakers on the topic of mass incarceration. I am Kaisa Peguero, uh, Programs Manager at the CAC, and I'll be your host this evening. Um, I come to you today from my home in New Orleans, which is uh, Bobancha is what it is called uh, by the Choctaw. Um, it is, it means uh, land of many tongues. And with that, I implore you to, um, in your own place where you are, find out and research the names of your tribes and think of the land where you sit and what it is called. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. We have tonight's episode, we'll have our guest, uh, Joe Kreider, artist, uh, artist director of Flyway Productions, uh, choreographer and director of The Weight Room as well as Sarita Stive, who is a co-founder of Operation Restoration, uh, was also the co-curator of her sister exhibition at the uh, Tulane Museum, and uh, excuse me, is also a criminal justice advocate. Um, tonight, we'll have a conversation with these two exploring um, the intersections between their advocacy work with justice um, towards decarceration uh, the implications of Sarita's uh, very recent presidential pardon, and also the, um, their perspectives on art and activism in the work that they do. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi. Um, I'm really super curious, Sarita, um, to really um, think through and first ask you what the impacts of this presidential pardon have been, uh, particularly because as as so much information is unknown about how really the arms of this of this system really latch on um, when you're in its walls and when you're outside of it, I would really love for you to talk through about what what's that what does that even mean that you've been uh, presidentially pardoned? Yeah, thank you for having us um, having us myself and Joe, but um, especially me, I'm grateful to be here and speak today. Um, so presidential pardon, for people that don't know, it effectively takes away um, your conviction and restores all of your civil rights, and it kind of makes it seem like what happened didn't happen um, as far as your conviction status is uh, concerned. So at the age of 19, I was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison, $1.9 million in restitution, and 20 years in state prison, all for the same crime. And um, the presidential pardon really takes away that federal restitution that I had, that I have been paying for the last 20 years. Um, the restitution, I often termed it as like the new life sentence because at 19, I was given this astronomical amount of money with a high school diploma with no, you know, thought about my earning capacity as I grew older or once I was released. And then all of the barriers that, um, you incur trying to re-enter society, it had been a very tremendous um, burden on myself and my family, um, you know, wondering if I would effectively be able to, you know, have leave a legacy to my children. If something happened to me, how would they be taken care of? And my parents were in the same boat wondering, like if something had to happen to them, you know, they essentially could not make sure that I was taken care of. So, um, it has been a tremendous relief to have the restitution um, lifted off of my shoulders. Um, so yeah, it was very important for that to happen. What, um, yeah, I was really curious. Uh, I know that like, uh, I'm sure that on top of like the voting rights that are taken away from, um, from folks who have been impacted by the carceral system um, and these restitutions, like you said, this second life sentence, I. I yeah, I can't even really imagine like what else is taken away, like what else, um, not to mention that you have this enormous amount of debt um, to go through. It is, it's really um, important and, and so valuable to hear about what that impact has been. And I, I just really wanna thank you for sharing that part thank of your story. You. I just wanna also add that like your conviction, as you mentioned, the voting rights um, does occur, that happens, but Louisiana passed a law that said if you were out five years, that um, you can now vote. And, you know, so I voted for the first time in wow. the um, last election um, prior to this presidential election. And, um, but I had been home and working in the hospital and contributing to society, but I couldn't vote, right? 
um, you know, there's also the denial of, of education. So right. people don't even think about the terms of like all of the consequences a federal conviction also eliminates. And, you know, people often use the terminology like returning citizen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it infers that I have citizenship rights once I am, you know, released back into society. And effectively, I don't, I don't have, you know, representation, you know, with taxation. I don't have the right to vote, the right to an education. Sometimes I'm discriminated against in housing, jobs, you know, and all of these things. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal to um, have that removed from my record. Yes, and congratulations. You Thank certainly, you. You certainly deserve it. Um, I, I know that we're gonna get more into all of the work that you've done that's come out of this uh, for you. Um, and really wanted to highlight how we've been having these conversations um, around decarceration and wanted uh, to hear more about uh, from Joe and from you, Sarita, what, um, how do you define it? Uh, what then is decarceration, especially compared to abolition? Either one of you can answer first. Um, well, I'll start and I just wanna pick up on your intro, Kaiza, and name that I'm speaking to folks from San Francisco, which is sitting on unceded Ramatush Ohlone land. And um, it's great to be with folks from Louisiana. Thank you. Um, so I am in the middle of creating a, a five-year project called the Decarceration Trilogy. And I chose the word decarceration because I loved how it sat in opposition to incarceration. At the same time, politically, I would really strongly identify as an abolitionist. And I believe in a both and strategy mm -hmm. in that we're not gonna abolish the prison system tomorrow but I believe in, in making choices that lead us there. And that is a decarceral process. So that's kind of where I come from as an activist in, in this world, as a woman with an incarcerated loved one and um, who's actually home. My partner is now home. Um, and you know, the returning citizen language is really interesting to me because I know there's a lot of people that have worked really hard to find language that is not ex-con. And, um, and, and th there's a lot of questioning of the word returning citizen in the Bay Area, at least, because, um, because of folks who are not um, you know, citizens. So the language that I'm hearing now is returning community member. And um, I'm wondering if that suits you better, Sarita, though I certainly have lived through the discrimination that, that, that returning folks experience um, in terms of housing jobs. Um, rental of an Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the language thing. Well, I'm a big proponent of language. It's so crazy to me that people think that like, I, I always think about returning as if I willingly went somewhere and that I was not kidnapped mm -hmm. and not and held against my will to be able to come back and return. You know, so for me, that's always like, funny to me is like, yeah, I, I returned, you know? Um, it was like, no, I was released from captivity. But um, I always implore people to use like people-centered language. So a person who has been in jail, a person who was arrested, a person who has had the experience, because I think when we put the adjective in front of the actual individual, they're always defined by that particular event. So for me, it is very, very important that we center people first. So it's not about the experience, it's about the person who had an experience. So even when I'm speaking in terms of someone who has been subject to abuse, I'm gonna say a person who has been abused or a person who has had whatever the experience may be because the, the reason why I feel like things are so acceptable to people who are incarcerated or things that happen to people that are incarcerated is because you take the humanity out of the conversation and you call them these other things. So you're often able to speak about the horrors and the atrocities that occur to people while they're incarcerated because we eliminate the word people, our person from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really amazing. I, uh, to point out um, the dehumanization of it, um, I think also uh, when you're thinking about like that language causes harm and can reduce harm um, and how we have this understanding um, of it, like you said, this dehumanization, um, very interesting. And it makes me wanna think about uh, asking you like how in your work then have, 
have y'all moved forward in reframing harm? Um, and if Joe, you could answer first. Yeah, I'm going to speak expli explicitly about the weight room, which is the first in the trilogy and the one that will be coming to New Orleans, formerly in April and now in September. Um, we let COVID push us forward a little bit. Um, but I chose to center the experiences of women who are part of an organization called SE Justice Group. And SE Justice was founded to um, call forward not the victimization of women with incarcerated loved ones, but our power. And I love that reframing right there. Um, and uh, Essie is mostly black and brown women and actually mostly black women and really centers black women in its work, um, but includes all women and gender nonconforming people who have an incarcerated loved one. And I'm, I'm grateful to Essie for that expansiveness and that specificity, because I feel like a, a focus on um, anti-blackness, on ending anti-blackness rather is really important if you're looking at prison systems. Um, but I also think that prison systems affect many people. Um, and so, you know, I have chosen in my work to first of all use dance and the beauty of the body in flight because I'm an aerial choreographer to um, um, really forward a sense of freedom and release um, to let us release ourselves. Um, the, the project involves uh, the oral histories of six women with incarcerated loved ones as well as six dancers um, almost all of whom have an incarcerated loved one, some more like frontally in their family than others. Um, but, you know, we are on a mission in the project to release ourselves from the burden of a system that dehumanizes and that that does not make anyone safe. Absolutely. Sarita, would you mind ask, answering if um, and how do you reframe harm? Work. So um, in our work, we have to really, really, really understand that you are really doing harm reduction work on the road to like a longer objective. You know, I love when Joe said earlier about like the reason why she chose decarceration and but at heart, she's really like an abolitionist, but she knows that you have to be doing both and or. So I know that in our work, when we choose to unapologetically focus on currently and formerly incarcerated women, and we leave out other women um, out of the conversation of the work that we do, we're causing harm to that community because individuals are constantly asking like, why can't I, you know, um, use these resources or why aren't you focusing on this particular demographic or this particular population or we get calls about, well, what about this group of women? And for us, we know that women traditionally have all just been lumped into one group and it's a kind of one size fits all. So we know that in doing this separation, as Joe mentioned, for women who have incarcerated loved ones mm -hmm. and focusing specifically on that population, we are then in turn harming other um, subsets of women that want to also utilize these services or have a commonality. But understanding that we're working, you know, I often call it an elephant and you take out one bite at a time to digest the whole animal, that we're really just working on our piece, right? And um, so I think that that is one way in our work that we cause harm, but we are trying to do harm reduction in that sense, but be very clear about what it is that we're working for. I think the other piece of it is that we are dealing with individuals who have uh, severe levels of trauma mm -hmm. sometimes and understanding that people are working through their trauma. So then they may not always respond in the best manner, but um, practicing grace and giving individuals an opportunity to show up as themselves in that situation without us taking it personal. So learning how we're not taking the pain in the outbursts of other women um, personally and giving ourselves and them that grace to like show up as their authentic selves. And that's not really always easy work, but I think that that is something that we do really well and that we 
really think is important. Um, and especially for women of color, you know, with all of the stigmas that are attached to women of color and like how we show up. So um, that is one thing that we really work hard on. Um, it really sounds like uh, the work that you've done is, uh, is to also recenter women um, as, the, as part of the reframing. Um, I wonder too, if you can talk more about, um, particularly with art, um, do you think that like art can be used to shift that narrative uh, of, um, of responsibility from harm? Like who tells who is harmed who does the harming away from this um, individual responsibility and shifting it more to the system's view. Um, can art do that? How have you used art to do that in the work you've done? So um, absolutely. I think that art is actually like critical in mm -hmm. that shifting um, of the narrative. So for instance, the persistent exhibit that we uh, co-create, uh, co-curated with the Newcomb Art Museum. Um, I wanted to say co-created so bad. <laughs> oh but, uh, <laughs> um, it was very important, you know, if we think about the country as a whole and historically, like all systems, systems of education, hospitals, prisons, they all were created for white men. You know, I always say in Benjamin Franklin's living room, all of these things were put into place. And if we think about that and what that means is that even hundreds of years later, everything that we aspire, those gold standards that we tried to assimilate were never built for like inclusivity. They were never built for creativity. They were never built to be gender responsive. Mm -hmm. And that's just what it is because at the time these things were created, they were created for white men. So none of these systems like traditionally fit us, even art form as a whole in of itself was only practiced a long time ago by white men. So the standards of these famous artists, you know, from centuries ago are still all built around white men. So if we take that and we know that is where we're working from, we also have to think about how subjects and artists have interactions or how a story is being told or how true are we staying to um, the individuals um, you know, thought process of how they should be portrayed. So one of the cool things that we did with the Persistent Art Exhibit for us was we allowed the individuals who were participating in this show to choose the artist that was able to render their story. And it happened in a multitude of ways. Some individuals looked at an artist's artwork and if that particular artwork spoke to them, then they were able to choose their artist. And then something was set up where you know, they were able to meet and collaborate on what the artwork would look like or mm -hmm. the, the telling of the story. Um, some people chose on energy. I was one of those people. I just went into the room and I found who my energy matched with. And that is who I chose to um, actually do my painting. So, um, and I had no idea of what type of art she was going to create. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it worked out like amazingly well. So I think that we have to challenge ourselves, even in the professions that we are currently in to mm -hmm. say like, how are we reinforcing these, um, systematic biases and really challenging like structural racism in everything that we do, because everything that we started from, from the bottom of how everything in this country was created. It was never created for creativity or inclusivity or any of those things. Right. Sounds like, you know, really dismantling who it is that, um, who does the narrating and then who it is that we, um, are, I know that you've mentioned this before, not in this meeting, but um, in this, sorry, this uh, conversation, but um, around who, who do we see as expert? Um, and who then do we present? And it makes me think of, of, of part of your work, Joe, is to um, including the oral histories of formerly incarcerated women that um, SE Justice Group works with um, their members. And um, thinking of the work of Pamela Z in particular, um, could you talk about what she does with um, how it incorporating this, uh, this language and, and giving this voice and this power to the, the stories of the women? Yeah, um, Pamela Z is a composer. She's based in San Francisco, but works internationally. And um, she and I have a 25 year habit of working together. And um, Pamela uses sound and text as music. Mm -hmm. And um, she has a gift for that. I've been saying for 25 years that she really deserves a McCarthy. 
for the work she does. Um, she's really just one of the best electronic music composers that's out there, who is out there. Um, and I, I just want to tell people about the process of collecting these stories, which is that we put a call out to Essie. We sent them our questions in advance so that um, there was an understanding of where we were coming from. I was already a member of Essie, which was very helpful because mm -hmm. I was asking questions of my sisters, not someone who is a subject in a study. Um, my sisters politically, I don't mean literally. Um, and so we brought the women to Pamela's studio in the Mission District and we set out a little feast and we had some food together. And then we sent the women into this teeny, teeny little sound booth where you can't hear anything on the outside and it's like beautiful for sound. And I asked the questions and um, the six women that we interviewed answered them. And um, I'll never forget one woman came out and said, wow, I just feel so much lighter now. So the ability to tell her story in her own words in an environment that felt safe and respectful. We also paid the women for their knowledge, for their expertise, which is really important to me as someone who works with oral histories pretty consistently, um, that that knowledge and scholarship should not come free. Um, it is an exchange and it is a gift given and it's given in a world where capital is a measure of value, so we pay. Um, we don't pay a whole lot because we're an art, teeny little arts organization, but we try. Um, so there's that. Um, but then the other thing I just wanted to share with Sarita is that people have come up to me and said, well, when are you going to make the piece about women who are on the inside? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to do that because that's not my experience. And there are so many other artists who are at the center of that story who are going to do that. And that's not my story to tell. So um, yeah, I think this both and uh, frame, I don't know that you cause harm because you choose a focus in your work, Sarita. Mm -hmm. I would say that many, many of us working choose a focus because we can't do everything. Um, and I think that's important though. I appreciate your naming, um, you know, how you feel you are situated in the world. Well, I think that I think that I, we don't intend to do harm by choosing a focus, but some people feel as if they have been harmed. I have had, um, you know, mothers reach out to me and ask me to help their son, or I've had, you know, women reach out to me and ask me to help their husbands or their brothers. And when I say no, I know that immediately they are in distress and they're upset. And I may try to connect them with other, you know, individuals. And sometimes I end on end up taking it on myself anyway, you know. But um, I think that even though it's like not our intention, you know, to do harm, I think that we have to accept that when someone tells us we're harming them, even though that's not our intention, like we are actually creating harm for them. Um, and not harm in a way of physical, you know, physical harm, but mentally, like knowing someone or you feel that someone can help you. Like the minute I got my pardon, I've had so many people reach out to the organization and say, you know, you can have, can you help me or can you help this person? You know, and even some of my friends that are formerly incarcerated that I work with every day, they're like, oh, so you're going to work on my pardon application next. And I'm like, no, I'm not, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I think we lost Kaisa. Yes, Kaisa was. Um, wow. Frozen. Okay, well, I'm sure she'll come back. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll just look at. Um, so, I don't know. One thing I know that came up in our conversations was um, how is art? how is the art that you do break through like a culture of voyeurism where people want to know your story like they like to look at a car crash? Has that come up for you at all? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's always going to be some level of voyeurism um, involved. I think that is why people are so attracted to like documentaries or to 
you know, um, true crime or, you know, whatever, because people want to have that inside intimate, like look into what's going on. And I think that also like for myself, especially me being a formerly incarcerated woman, like I could be standing in a room and they say, pick the person that has went to prison and nobody would choose me based on, you know, my look or my family history. Like my mom was a judge when I went to prison. My dad was a supervisor at an oil refinery. So like, I am not the person that you normally associate with, you know, going to prison or come from the socioeconomic background, we assume that goes to prison. So I think for me, the voyeurism component is maybe something that I'm kind of like betting on because people don't, when they find out that I went to prison and I served almost 10 years in prison, they're like, oh my God, why? What happened? What are you doing? You know, and that is my opportunity to really like talk about the work that we do and say, in spite of these things, this is what happens. So, um, but it goes back to that point, Joe. I think it doesn't feel like voyeurism if I am considered the expert and I'm not just up telling my story and getting emotional in front of a crowd, but I'm being valued for my expertise and I'm able to talk about my experience, be compensated as an expert um, in this field. Because I often say, you know, um, in any other discipline, any other discipline that exists, people are gonna be compensated. You're gonna go to a doctor for medical advice, an attorney for legal advice, whatever. And if you're creating a panel, you're going to have people from that discipline to speak about what happens. But when it comes to incarceration, we get these people with these PhDs and all of their experience out of books and these data analytics and, you know, just these people that have no intimate knowledge to tell us as a population what is best for us, as if somehow because we went to prison, we're uneducated. And um, I really think that you have to change the narrative and shift the narrative. And as long as I'm being valued for my expertise, I think that takes away the uh, voyeurism component for me. Hmm. That's great. Um, I was at a lecture yesterday at UC Santa Cruz. Of course, it was on Zoom, but I was there in spirit. And um, it was on abolition feminism. And um, the women, one of the women, her name was Beth Ritchie, who's an academic speaking of PhDs, <laughs> um, but she talked about, um, you know, moving past the troubles and that the people should be, who should be doing that work are those who have been harmed. Those are the people that should lead us out. And that's something I really believe. And as we come into the second in our trilogy, looking at black and Jewish relationships to race and capture, um, we have centered the experience of a man named Rasan Thomas who has worked with us from his cell at San Quentin. And um, he and I co-created, well, it's about to premiere. And again, every COVID ruined our timeline, but it's gonna premiere in October. Um, and he and I co-created a piece of public art while he was in San Quentin. And we did two other things. We also created an art exhibit of um, his friends and colleagues in San Quentin which is something that neither of us had ever done and had no expertise at all, but we pulled it off and it was really um, an exciting thing to do. And we did that in partnership with Museum of African Diaspora. So um, it's the first time that the museum had um, highlighted the work of folks who are working from behind the walls. And um, it feels really good as someone who has the agency outside to get larger arts institutions to say, these are artists we need to really um, lift up. So I, I'm, I'm really happy that Persister also did that. And I love the collaboration model that's, that's built into Persister. I find that really feminist, um, you know, that the, the, the co-lead between the artist and the, and the person whose story is being told is just such a beautiful model. And I'm really thinking about that um, as I move forward in my own work. So that's quite a gift to me to, to know about it. That's amazing. Oh, I, I was talking about the, um, I thought it was awesome about the sound to the word mm. component of the work that you do. Um, I just thought that that was really powerful too about how, you know, the way that a person answers a question and you, at each word has its own sound um, was like amazing to me because as I was talking to you earlier, I was let, telling you about the 
orchestra component that we were creating for the women inside of prison. So in partnership with the New Orleans Chamber Orchestra, we prior to COVID were working on creating a you know full length orchestra from poems that women who were incarcerated wrote. And um, the past two years, we've been bringing a Christmas orchestra into the prisons and jails to the women. And um, when you said that, I was just like, oh my God, like even, you know, having those poems to like put to sound. So those words make their own sounds, like how this poem sounds in that art form, you know? So that's extremely interesting um, to me. So amazing to hear about um, how you guys continue to really weave uh, art and the empowerment of the folks who need to tell the story with it. Um, and I'm really curious, um, I completely agree with Joe that it's a really beautiful model uh, that her sister had. And I'm, I'm curious to, to know, and I'm sure other people are curious um, about the future of her sister. Are there other iterations? So her sister, still lives on. Um, prior to COVID, it was in the Ford Foundation Gallery. They actually picked it up and they were supposed to show it through May. So um, I think they moved it to an online model and I think it stayed longer than May, but we are when the world is safe again. Um, a museum in South Carolina had agreed to show it as well as in Michigan. And I think one other, um, venue. So Persista will still be traveling. Um, but yes, there is another iteration that we are currently working on. And I think it will premiere probably in 2022. And it is focused on kids who are incarcerated. So telling the stories of the kids that are incarcerated much in the same way that Persista did. But of course, it's going to look different because of the, the, the age group that we're focusing on. And then also um, really trying to stay true to the model of the actual individuals leading the work and choosing the artists and that particular model. So, you know, there's just a lot of other things that you work through when you're dealing with kids, you know, who are incarcerated or detained. That was the other thing that was really important to also bring uh, forth the voices of children that are in detention as well as children who are incarcerated. So um, yeah, that's the next iteration um, and it should be opening in 2022. Wow, um, I know we're all gonna look forward to it. That sounds really, um, really beautiful to, uh, to center the youth and, and um, who are in these centers and facilities. And I really have seen the, the, moder of per, uh, the model of her sister exhibition as, um, as a model of care also with um, not only the people who are, who the stories belong to um, and giving them not a seat at the table, but a whole table. And um, I was really, uh, really touched by the way that the exhibition, um, there was this a care room, there was like a mental health uh, care room that people can like sit in and have um, fidgeting toys to calm down as it is a really uh, powerful, emotional, um, and I can't imagine uh, what the sentiments of someone who, um, who's been impacted by the system experience. So I, I'm really thrilled to see um, how that, that model of care shifts and change and expands for youth. I think that there's something really uh, poignant and transformative about that. Um, and actually, while we're on the conversation for, for Sister, there's actually a, um, a question from a, a Facebook, someone watching on Facebook. Um, and um, it's for Sarita. And it says that um, in the Persister exhibit, there was um, only, I'm so sorry, just lost the question. I can read it. There was not only visual art, but also music. Can you talk about why it was important for the exhibit for some of the stories to be expressed in song? Yeah, so we really contacted artists from every um, arena. So we created, I mean, we consulted with individuals that created art through music, through still life painting, through photography through contemporary art. So we wanted to put a wide range of artists in this show to meet the wide ranges of women that would participate. So if a woman, um, I guess, connected with someone who did their artwork through music, then they connected and they did their story. So we didn't want it to just be all contemporary art or all um, 
photographic art or through poetry, because there were also written art as well. Um, we wanted it to be expansive of multiple artists and as well as um, whoever the women decided that they could connect with. So that was really, really important to us to not pigeonhole the exhibit to be a particular showing of one style of art. So it was very, very important to have music um, as well. And even something that I thought was really cool, and it brings me back to Joe with like the oral history component, there was a timeline throughout the whole museum. So from the time that you walked in, you were able to see like when the first prisons were created and follow that through to Louisiana and how we've incarcerated people in the rise of incarceration of women. There were also a lot of um, cartoon graphics inside of the actual space. So it would be kid friendly and that kids could also read and be able to follow along if they came with their parents. So it was a lot of work that was put in to make sure that anyone who came through the door could experience uh, her sister. Thank you for that. Um, that question actually came from Megan Holt. Uh, they run uh, One Book One New Orleans, which is a nonprofit that brings literacy and reading to prisons across Louisiana. Yeah, thanks Megan for that. And thanks Megan for your work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for, for really sharing um, and talking to so much about um, what you have worked on, what you will continue to work on. Um, I know that this work is, is so pivotal and, and so, um, so necessary to hold these conversations. Um, so I, I thank you for being here um, to the audience. Oh, actually, I have one more question. I completely forgot. Um, as we're having these conversations, um, we really want to um, impart and make known from y'all what is um, a call to action? What is a way that folks can get involved um, in any action that you guys can think of with, with your organizations, with your communities and your networks? Um, I'll start just because I have a slightly more abstract answer and um, maybe Sarita has a more concrete answer. But in addition to my work with SE, I also work with an organization called Ben the Ark Jewish Action. And it's an organization of social justice driven Jewish activists of which I include myself. And um, we've been talking a lot about fear. Why are people afraid when it comes to the conversation of prison abolition and changing the systems of accountability so they don't cage and dehumanize, but they actually enact real accountability and transformation? Why is that scary? And so my call to action is to ask people who are listening to ask yourself, and ask the folks who you might be having dinner with tonight or someone you might be on a call with who maybe doesn't think exactly like you to talk about the fear, to go into the fear and see if you can get to the other side of it. Um, that would be my request. Powerful reflection, definitely. Um, I do have direct calls of action. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> Um, but it's twofold, you know, of course, um, if you have the urge to volunteer or donate or anything of the sort, you can always go to www.or-nola.org, um, which is the website for Operation Restoration. And it gives a lot of information around the 15 different programs that we have and how you can get involved or how you can support. Um, so that's always my first ask. The second ask is that you know, people often think that because they're one person that they shouldn't speak up for injustices or change anything or work on something because they're like, I'm just this one person. You know, what could I do to address this systemic issue? And I think all it takes is one person who's passionate enough to create a movement or change the world. And we have seen that over and over, you know, in history, especially as it relates to the rights of human beings. So I think that if you innately feel in your spirit that something is wrong in your art form, you know, and, and you have this art form that you're able to express it through, then think about the biggest and the most encompassing thing that you can create to get the language or the message out. Or, you know, if your expertise is 
writing policy, what type of policy can you write and disseminate across the country for our folks? Um, or just speak up about it. You know, I often talk to a lot of my white friends and they say, I don't feel like I have a voice in this conversation. Like I should really be quiet and be supporting you and your work. And I often say, no, I don't want to support it. I don't want, you know, uh, like a friend, I need accomplices. I need people who are going to get out and get in trouble with me and stir up some things. And it's also the responsibility of each individual community to converse and talk to and convince people who are like-minded. So to my white women friends, I say, no, you need to be speaking to white women and telling them why you believe what you believe and getting them to understand where you're coming from and what it is that we're fighting for. So I think that um, those are my specific, you know, call to action. Awesome. Thank you uh, both for that. Um, following our conversation, you'll see some slides with some links to, um, to where to donate and um, how to support uh, Operation Restoration, um, as well as a couple upcoming events that the CAC has. Um, some of these links will also be, actually all of these links will be in the um, description below in this Facebook uh, event box. And um, yeah, uh, thank you all for sharing. Thank you again um, for this really powerful message. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a really uh, poignant to ask people to reflect on their fear. Um, and then to bring that reflection in conversation with other other people. Um, thank you for that, for that, Joe and Sarita. Um, yeah, that everyone can make a change and can get involved and you do have a, a say and you do have power. Um, it's certainly um, at the forefront of, of your work and letting everyone know that. And um, just thank you. Uh, thank you for this powerful work. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you uh, to Facebook viewers out there. Thank you for watching. Um, share, like, uh, bring people into this conversation. Um, and stay tuned for uh, when, for more information on when uh, the way room will be coming to um, the CAC. And I just also really wanted to thank the CAC for centering gender and justice together in one fell swoop and also being willing to take on um, incarceration for the problem that it is. It's really inspiring that an arts institution of, of your magnitude is, is willing to do that so beautifully. So thank you. Thank you, Sarita. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You as well, Joe. I enjoyed the conversation. I hate that we don't have any more time to answer the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you. Good night.